Hello, my fellow gnomes, and welcome back to episode 20 of our tower defense. Although, you may notice we've not really got much of a tower defense right here. That's because I've hopped into a brand new empty base plate, base plate, base plate file, because we're going to be building our lobby today. So hit stop. So that file that you've been working on with the game, make sure you keep that nice and safe, keep that handy. But we're going to need a brand new base plate for our lobby because that's going to be a separate place within the game. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off by making a elevator, right? I think a lot of people want uh, an elevator type lobby. It's pretty cool. You see it uh, in a few tower defense games, you see it in a few flood escape type games. It's quite a popular method of teleporting the players between uh, servers. So we're going to go ahead and use that. So I'm going to add in this big part here. And I'm just going to make it sort of 20 studs high. Because we need something for our elevator to run down. And we're just going to make this, yeah, rough thing, right? And then we're going to add in a spawn point right on the top here. So now that's where we'll spawn in. Make sure this is anchored. There we go. And now we're going to create our elevator. So we're going to create one part. And this is going to be a long, thin part like so. So we'll make it uh, two by two. And then that will be 20 studs high as well. So it's the same height as this platform we've created. And then right next to it, we're going to create a, another part. Okay. And this is going to be the platform that our, that our players stand on. So, well, we can make this as big as we want. But if we're going to have quite a, a couple of players on it, we probably want it to be quite big. So maybe we'll make this, let's make it nice and big. Let's make it 20 studs, uh, 20 studs wide. So there we go, 20 by 20. And we'll just move this back. So this we're going to name the platform. We'll name it platform, keep track of it. And this will be the sort of the... The pole or the, the shaft that travels down. We'll, we'll name this shaft and let's give this a material of a, a diamond plate so we can sort of see what we're working with. Okay, so now we've got the setup. We want to make sure that our shaft is anchored and the platform we can leave unanchored. So obviously if we run the game now, that's just going to fall to the floor like so. Not very exciting. So what we're going to, going to need to do is add in a constraint. Now I saw B Ricey over on YouTube. He's got another Roblox development channel. I'd recommend checking him out. He was using a prismatic constraint for his elevator, which I thought was pretty cool. So we're actually going to go ahead and use his method. So go to the create tab up here. So model tab and then create. And we're going to add in one of these constraints. We're going to add in the prismatic constraint. So we click there. And then we have this little cursor now when we hover over a part, which is where we're going to place a attachment. I'd recommend having your snap to grid on right here. So I have it snap to grid set to on, set to one stud. So it gives me a bit more control rather than it just being off and me sort of being freehand here. I like to keep things nicely regimented. So we're going to place this on the edge of the part, okay? So we hovered over the shaft and we're just going to move it right to the edge here. And so that's, now we can see in our workspace, it's got that attachment zero part inside of it. And then we've got this other cursor now with a line attached. So that's where we're going to put the second attachment. So we want this to be on the platform. Now we don't want it to be way out here in the center. We actually want it to be right on the edge. So it's overlapping the other attachment we made. So if I put it here, you can't actually see the cursor anymore. But you can see I'm still selecting the platform. And if I click and then we see in the output, we've had a prismatic constraint created. And inside the platform, we've now got that attachment one. There we go. So now if I was to hit run, the part's going to drop to the floor again. But if I was to sort of click and drag this over here, say, and release it, watch what happens. It slides back. So that constraint is going to keep it so it's always against this part right here. So wherever I move it, even if I move it behind, it's still going to insist that it's attached to this part. It's sort of like a weld that we can move. So hit stop. 
And what we want to do is set some settings for this constraint. So if we scroll down and where it says actuated type, we're going to set this to servo. And when we do that, we have a bunch of new options appear. And the speed is self-explanatory. We're going to set this to five. The max force is how much force can be applied. Now, this doesn't control how fast it will go. That's controlled by the speed. It's just the amount of force. Because remember, if we've got lots of players stood on here, then it's going to take more force to move up and down. So we're just going to set a really big number. Right, we'll spam in a bunch of nines, and that'll be fine. And then the target position is currently at zero. So if I was to actually run the game now, we'll actually see the platform stays in place. That's because the zero point is where that attachment is. And I could actually change that. So if I set the, the, uh, the target position to be minus 10, then suddenly we see this blue line appear. If you don't see that blue line, head back to the model tab and make sure you have constraint details set to on and the draw on top as well. So then we can see these details. And now we can see if we hover over the blue line, it's telling us that the servo force is going to try and head down to this point. And if we click run, that's going to happen. There we go. It might be a good idea to set some limits as well. So if we select block on the string again, we'll tick limits enabled and we're just going to prevent it. So at the moment, now we've got this green line appeared and the green line is default to the lower limit being zero and the upper limit being five. So this would be if you wanted it to head upwards, whereas we only wanted to go down. So we're going to set our upper limit to be zero, but our lower limit to be right down at the bottom. So we'll set this to minus 18. Okay, we don't need it to go right to the very bottom. Um, it's probably better if it doesn't push against the floor. So we'll put it to minus 18 just to give it a little bit of buffer. And then the type position, we can set that to minus 18 now. So that blue line would fill up. And now if we hit run, it would run down all the way to the bottom. But obviously it's going to stop before it hits that limit. Cool. So how about we do this from a script now? So let's go in to, uh, where shall we put this script? Let's just put this script in the workspace for now. And we'll just create a variable for our prismatic constraint. So we'll say local prismatic equals workspace dot shaft dot prismatic constraint. And then we could create a function called something like move elevator. And all we need to do is we would set the prismatic dot target position to be equal to. So we set that to minus 20. And then we can just wait a short while. Maybe we'll wait 10 seconds. And then we can just set the position to be zero again. So we'll go back up to the top. And that's that's pretty much it. We'll just, we can just try running that now. Run that little function we've just made. And now if we click play, we should see it goes down. It takes a little bit less than 10 seconds, probably like six seconds. So it's going to wait a little while. And then eventually once 10 seconds is reached, it's going to head back up again. There we go. And we could do this with our player as we wanted as well. Just to prove it works, right? I can walk over here and be on the elevator. And if I wait for it to go back up, which it eventually will do, Da, 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 here we go and it goes back up but hopefully the player is never going to see this so let's hit stop now we don't want them to be able to get on and off the elevator we sort of want them to be once they're waiting for the game we want them to sort of know who's in our lobby rather than sort of quickly jumping in and out so what we're going to do is we're going to create a kind of cage around the elevator to cure to keep the players in our in our basement or something i don't know so let's add this part now and we're just going to wrap it around like so we can make it nice and high um, but we'll set the transparency to be 0.5 just for now so we can sort of see what we're working with make sure it's anchored 
and then we will move our part. So it's just on the edges of the platform. We don't want it to be overlapping like this, so it's going to get in the way of the platform. Um, but it doesn't matter if it overlaps this part. The shaft part doesn't really matter. But we're going to move this all the way down so it's touching the floor. Uh, we can do that with this one as well. So that's both of these. Control D to duplicate, Control R to rotate. And there we go, we've got our container on all sides. And then we're just going to need a roof as well. So we apply this on the top. There we go. So they're not getting anywhere now. Although it does mean that our player can't get in either. So in order to get in, we're going to use a, another part in front of the, the glass container. And this is going to act as a teleport. So let's make this part uh, green so we can see it. And we're just going to resize that so it fills up all the front face of the of the box or the cage and we're going to name the part we will name it entrance make sure it's anchored again and again we'll just set the transparency to 0.5 so we can see what's happening eventually we'll set all of it to fully transparent so now we've got this this funny little thing uh let's organize we've got all these parts in the workspace looks a little bit messy so let's select all the parts of our glass box Select all of them, Control G to group them, or we'll just name this um, box. Then we've got this part, uh, which is just part of our lobby, we can ignore that. But we're going to group the box, the entrance, the shaft, and the platform. Group them all together and we'll just name it Elevator. So now we've got the, the elevator on its own, we can kind of see what we're doing. So the next thing we're going to need, if we're going to touch this part and we want to be teleported in, we probably want a part to teleport us to. So we'll add in yet another part, and we can give this a blue color. And we're going to place this where we want our, our players to appear in, inside the, inside the, the box. And whichever way you this part is facing is the way our players will appear. So put the orientation indicator on and we can see that it's facing forwards, which is good. So we'll name this one teleport in and we'll duplicate it, rotate it round and then we'll move this one just outside and we'll name this teleport out. Make sure both of these are anchored and can collide you want to disable and then click and drag that into the elevator as well and make sure that entrance part uh, we can disable collisions on it but just make sure that can touch is ticked so once we've done that we can then script getting into the box we'll move this script into the elevator now open it up and let's create a variable for our elevator. So local elevator will simply equal script.parent. And then this, instead of saying workspace, will be elevator.shaft. So let's create a new function to detect when somebody enters the, the box, or not when they enter the box, when they touch this entrance part, this green part. So right at the bottom, we can say elevator dot and we'll just use the touched event elevator dot entrance sorry and we use the touched event connect that into a function which will give us whatever part hits and what we want to do is check if that part is part of a player's character so we're going to need to grab the player's service local players equals game get service players and then we can say that the character if it's a character, it should equal players, and we use the get player from character function and provide it the parent of whatever part has hit. So if it's sort of like a left leg or something, then the parent of the left leg will be the character, and that will be a player character, so therefore this will actually return something. Otherwise, this will just return false. So then we can check if we have got a character, 
So if we have got a player, yes, because this returns as a player. Sorry, not local character, local player. If we have got a player, then we can move them into the box. So player dot character dot primary part, which should be their humanoid root part, and we'll set the C frame of that equal to the C frame of that part we just added up the teleport in part. Elevator dot teleport in dot C frame. So let's just uh, see if that's working. We can disable the elevator from moving for now, but we'll just keep this function here. So let's hit play and we'll enable our output. Seen as we're scripting, we've always got to have our output open to check for any errors. So we've got a part, I'm going to touch this entrance part. And when I do, I get teleported into the box. So we know that's working for us. Uh, let's make sure our elevator, um, we don't know going straight down to the bottom, do we? Let's make sure that it's target that target position initially is zero, just so it stays at the top and it doesn't go anywhere. Next thing we need to do is sort of add that player that's moved into the box into a waiting list. So we're going to have a value or a, a table at the top and we'll name this players waiting and that's going to be a table so we use these curly brackets like so. And then what we're going to do is we'll say table dot insert. So insert into the players waiting table, comma. And the thing we're going to add in is that player, that player object. So if we're adding them to the table, before we do so, we should probably check if they're already inside of the, of the table. Because we don't want to add them to the table multiple times, do we? So to do that, we'll use another function and this is a variable we'll call it is waiting and we'll use the table dot find function so this to this you provide the table players waiting and the thing you want to look for player so obviously the first time this runs through um, this table is going to be empty so it's not going to find anything at all but then that first time it is we're then going to add ourselves into that table so if this is fired this this touched event is fired multiple times it's not going to run this code multiple times because it's going to find we're in the table and it won't do this so let's just add the condition so if player and not is waiting so this needs to be false so if we play that now it's going to run pretty much the same as before right we can head into the box and there we go we're we're sort of stuck in here at the moment you might not want to have the player's camera though to be stuck inside the box like this. Uh, a lot of games would have the camera fixed while you're in the box. That way, when the, the elevator goes down, you're not actually watching all the way. So if we want to control the camera, we're gonna to need to have to do that from a local script. We're gonna add in a GUI as well. So we're gonna to go to start a GUI, add in the screen GUI, and we can just call this, we can keep it as screen GUI, I suppose. But we're gonna add in a text button because we actually need a way to get out of the box. Because we can't get out through the walls, we're gonna use a button to teleport us back out, back to this part right here. So let's move our text button uh, to where we want it. We want it to be, I think, half the way across the screen and maybe 0.8 of the way down. Um, we'll change the anchor point to be 0.5, like so, that should keep it centered. And then the size of it, how big do we want it to be? Uh, let's try 0 0.10, 0 0.10. I think that works. We're gonna give it a red background color. And then for the, the text, you're going to set that to Oswald, make sure the text color is white and we're going to scale it and it will just say exit like so. Maybe we'll name the button rather than just being called text button, we'll name it exit as well. And maybe we'll even add in a little UI uh, corner just to round things off. 
0 0.10. There we go. So now we've got the little exit button. So now let's write our local script. So we're going to need to, in order to communicate between our server script here, let's name this elevator server and our client script, we're going to need to use a remote event. So to replicate the storage and add in that remote event. And let's just call this elevator that works for me. And so then we need to reference it from our local script. So let's start off by getting the replicated storage equals game get service replicated storage and then we can get the event local elevator event will equal replicated storage wait for child elevator and then we'll create a variable for our GUI which is just the, the parent of the script and then we're going to need um let's create one for the the button as well local exit button equals gui dot exit and then finally we need one for the camera because we're going to be changing the camera about so the local camera will equal workspace dot current camera whichever camera the player is currently using so when this event is fired, this elevator event on client event, we want to connect it into a function because we want to run some code. And I think this function will probably provide um, which elevator they're using as a parameter. So we'll be expecting that. Make sure it's in those brackets so we're ready to capture it. And what we're going to do is we're going to set that exit button to be visible. So we'll set that equals to true when they enter it because we don't want this exit button to be visible all the time, do we? Because we've got nothing to exit. So by default, we want the visibility of this to be false. But if we enter into the box, then we'll make the button visible. Okay, and then the next thing we want to do is move the camera. So camera, and we'll set the camera type equal to enum.cameratype.scriptable. So this allows us to change it rather than being controlled by those default scripts and following the player around the map. And for this, we're not really going to do anything fancy. All I'm going to do is I'm going to add in a part. So in fact, this teleport out part, I'm just going to duplicate that. And I'll move it somewhere like over here. And we can rotate it down, probably not 50, uh, maybe 15 degrees or so just so it's looking roughly down like so. So the camera will be a bit positioned about here. We could move it back a little bit if we wanted. And we'll just name the part camera. And we'll just check so we can use the show orientation indicator, which way it's facing and the front is facing forward. So that's all good right there. And we'll set the transparency of this to be uh, one. We don't need to see this. Make sure it's anchored and there's no collisions on it. So once we've done that, in our local script, we would set the camera.c frame to be equal to the elevator.camera.c frame. So now we just need to fire this event from the server. So we can copy these two lines because we're going to need the replicated storage and the event. Head into our server script and we can add them in like so. And then copy that event and when they're when they've been added in we will say elevator event fire site fire client and we will the first argument is the the player right that player that we've just got and then the second is the elevator and we've already got a variable for that at the top so that's all we need to do so now let's hit play and see if that's working for us so far so we're outside of the box. If I touch the green part and enter, I'm inside the box and now my camera is in that fixed position. So let's say the elevator was to move down suddenly. Right, if I go and configure it, go to the, the prismatic constraint while the game is still running. And if I set the, the target position to be minus 18, then I'm gonna move down and I'm gonna sort of disappear out of view. 
right? Whereas if my camera was still focused on me, if I just changed this to custom, right? Then it would look kind of rubbish. You could see I hadn't actually gone anywhere. But if we keep the camera in that fixed place, it gives us the effect that we have. So the next thing to do is actually control this exit button. So we can write some code for that. Exit button dot activated. And we'll connect that into a function again. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna, first of all, disable the button as soon as it's pressed because we don't want them pressing it multiple times. So we'll say exit button dot visible equals false now. And then we'll set the camera. We can copy this and make sure the camera type, instead of being scriptable, is now going to be custom, which we can see is the default mode used. Now we don't need to set the C frame because this will be handled automatically by the camera subject, which shouldn't have changed. Um, it should still be the, the humanoid of the character, but just in case we will reset it. So we'll set this to be the player Sorry, the player dot character dot humanoid. And we're going to need a variable for our player, aren't we? So we can do that easy enough. Local player equals game dot players dot local player. There we go. So once we've reset all of our camera, we're going to actually need to tell the server that we want to leave. So again, we're going to need to communicate with the server script. And for that, we'll use a remote event and we might as well just use this remote event that we've already got, right? Because we're only using it one way so far. So we can just you have it for a different purpose for going back to the server. So now we can say elevator event via server. And we don't need to send any information because all it's doing is it's just telling them they want to, to leave. So head back into our server script. And now we will need to say elevator event dot on server event. And we'll connect that into a function, which of course will have the player who sent the moat event as a parameter. And what we're going to do here is we're just going to check, first of all, if they're in a table. How do we do that? Well, remember, we've already done it up here. So we can just copy that line again, see if they're waiting. And if they are waiting, then we're just going to remove them from the table. So table, oh, table dot remove, and we provide the players waiting table followed by is waiting, which is actually an index to where they were found in this table. And then we just need to teleport them back. So we'll check if they actually, if they have a character, which they should do unless they've sort of reset and then tap the, the exit button at the same time. We'll set their player dot character dot primary part dot C frame to be equal to the elevator dot teleport out dot C frame. So now let's click play and see if that's running for us. Okay. Outside the box, go and enter. We're stuck in the box, hit exit and we're back out. Cool. So now we can see all that's working. We can probably go and set all these parts to be fully transparent. So it will look a little bit better then. We'll just select all of these, set the transparency to one and make sure the box is fully transparent and the entrance part as well. So now that'll look a little bit less ugly. Oh, <laughs> I walked off the wrong side of the platform. Let's try that again. It's because it's a gray platform. It almost blends in. And there we go. So that's a little bit smoother, right? It's not obvious that I'm heading into a box in the same way. And there's no way that I can sort of run off the platform at all. So there we go. That's the, the easy part done, if you will. Uh, the next thing we need to do is we need to have some kind of countdown, right? When players enter the box. So to do that, we should probably have a, a billboard GUI, a, a screen to show them information. So let's add in a new part and we can add it into here. It can go uh, above the, the elevator. That's not a problem. It's not going to get in the way. 
And we're going to put it somewhere like there. We can name the part green. I'm just going to make this white and make sure it's anchored. And then we'll add in a, not a billboard GUI, but a surface GUI. And to that, we add in a, I think a text label. It's going to be positioned up there in the top corner, but we don't want that. We want it to be all the way across. So one, zero, and then half the height and zero again. Fantastic. And then for our background, let's make it something colorful, right? We'll give it a, a blue color, maybe a bit too much. How about a light blue? There we go. Uh, the font. Uh, what's the name of the, the cool font? A nice big, is it luckiest guy? That's a nice bold font. We'll go with that. We'll scale it up so it's nice and big. Set the text color to white. There we go. So it's really nice and visible. You can easily read that. And this, the text of it is just going to say something like zero out of two players. And then, so this one is going to be named. We're going to name this text label to be title. And then we're going to clone it. And we're going to name this one to be status. So we're going to need to position this just below. So make sure we put 0 0.5 there. It's going to appear below. We'll set the background color of this, I don't know, to white. And then the text can be black. Uh, maybe we'll use a different font. How about that? Um, let's set the text stroke transparency to zero as well. So it's kind of bold. There we go, that works for me. So this one will say something like waiting for players. And then we can have a countdown. So we could say teleporting in five and, and so on. So all these status texts will actually set up from our script. But this gives you an idea of what it will look like. So let's do it from our script then now. Let's open up the elevator server. So when a player joins, well, we need to check if, um, if they're the first player to join, right? Because we don't want to have two sort of countdowns going on at the same time. So we are going to have a function called something like local function run countdown. Uh, but we're going to have a control variable as well called local countdown running. So initially that'll be false and then it will be set to true inside of this function as soon as it starts. So this will just have a for loop, right? Pretty simple stuff. For i equals 10, comma, 1. So start off at 10, go down to 1 in increments of minus 1, 2. And then we will set the, the GUI. We, so we need a variable for our GUI now. So local GUI will equal elevator dot where is it? Is it screen? Oh yeah, let's move it into the elevator model. There we go. Elevator dot screen dot surface GUI. And that's it. So then we can use that GUI variable inside of here. GUI dot status dot text, and that will be equal to starting in dot 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 or colon maybe space dot dot to concat to add on a value and we use that i so whatever increment of the loop we are on or iteration of the loop and then we're going to wait one second pass dot wait one and then let's check if we've actually still got players so if hashtag players waiting is less than one if someone is left then in that case we're we can set the countdown running to false and we can just exit out of there. So we'll use the return word. Otherwise, if we've finished the loop successfully, let's call that move elevator function. So we're actually going to move it once the countdown is finished. And then once we've done that, then we can set the countdown running to false. So now inside of our script here where they touch, 
and we've teleported them inside, then we can check if the if not countdown running, then run countdown. And now let's click play and give it a quick test. So here we go. We've got our little elevator thing. We move up into it. Now we've got our countdown starting in 987 and so on and so on. We haven't updated our title text. We'll need to do that in a moment. But let's just check that our elevator successfully moves us down. There we go. And then it'll move us back up again in a moment as well. And here we go. We come back up and we can exit. And there we go. Wonderful stuff. So yeah, let's add that, uh, that title text. Now you'll notice I put out of two. So you might want to have elevators for different amounts of people. And in order to do this, we'll use a, a config value. So let's add a config. We'll just name it config rather than configuration. I think that's a bit of a mouthful. So that's added into the model. And then into here, we'll add in an int value. And we'll just call this something like max players. So the max amount of people that can be inside of it. So we'll set the max players to be two. Since this is a two player one, that's what we've typed there at least. Obviously, we could change this to whatever number we like, but we'll go with two. And now we can use that inside of our script. So that's another thing to check now when a player is added. So we need to check and the amount of players waiting. So hashtag players waiting. If that is less than the, the maximum players that we're allowing, we don't want to end up with five players in our two player elevator, do we? So let's get a variable for the config, put that at the top local config equals elevator dot config. I mean, I guess you don't really need variables for all these kind of things, but I think it's kind of easier to do. So yeah, if it, the number of players waiting is less than the config dot max, sorry, max players dot value, then we can add them, but otherwise, right, we don't want to, but then we can add or we can edit that text of our screen of our surface GUI title text. Once we've inserted them into the table, then we can say GUI dot title dot text, and that'll be equal to the, the number of players waiting. So hashtag players waiting again, dot dot, and they want that slash. So we add in a quotation marks and a slash and then another dot dot to add on the next value, which will be the config dot max players dot value. And then maybe we'll add another dot dot because we want it to say players on the end like so. So then we put in quotes again, space players. So that'll update it whenever anybody joins, but we're also going to need to update it when somebody leaves as well. So make sure we copy this line and put it down here to the, oh yeah, here we go, the elevator event. And we can just put it right there in the middle. That works for me. And we're probably gonna want to have a function just to set everything up initially. So let's create a function at the very top, local function setup. And here we're going to set the title of the text initially. We can also set the gui.status.text to be uh, waiting. And then we're going to make sure the we reset the players waiting table to a blank table each time. And we're also going to have a another value, another variable, like a control variable that we're just going to call moving. So if the elevator is moving or not. Initially, that will be false. And we make sure we set the false in the setup script each time. It's going to be true uh, while the elevator is running. So in the move elevator, we'll set that to true. And we might as well set that GUI status text as well here. So GUI.status.text equals teleporting players dot 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 with an uppercase P because why not? And then we set the moving to true. 
And then if we scroll down, we're going to want to make sure that we player can't enter while this is moving. Uh, so we'll wait another maybe just eight seconds for it to go back up. And then we'll set the moving back to false. But now we need to check when someone tries to join the elevator. We won't let them join if it's already moving. So we'll add an extra condition on here. So if player and not is waiting and the number of players is less than the max values and not moving. Okay, so it's a bit of a long line, but there we go. So let's hit play and we should hopefully see our text set up. There we go, zero up to we'll join. Now I've got the countdown starts. And if I was to suddenly exit the elevator while it's running, then it still stays, stays stuck on starting in four. Obviously that's no good. So let's, instead of on our exit event, or in fact, we can do this from our countdown, our countdown here. So if the number of players is less than one, yeah, we set the countdown running to false and we will run the setup one more time. So we should hopefully see a countdown. And then if I exit, there we go. It goes back to waiting again, zero out of two. But now let's wait for it to go down to uh, back down to one. And then we should see teleporting like we've set it to do. Teleporting players. There we go. And then we go down into the void. And then at this point, we will call teleport service and actually teleport them to that other place. And back up we come. Okay, so that's pretty much what we want for our a script. Oh, there's one more thing we need to do, which is uh, we need to hide hide the players uh, the players exit button when they're teleporting. We don't want them to be able to leave uh, mid teleport. So in order to do that, let's create a, another remote event. And we'll just call this moving moving elevator or something. And then we're going to need to fire this from our server. So when we are in the, the move elevator function, what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to loop through all of the players waiting. So for I player in as players waiting do, and then we'll, we'll call that that remote event. So let's create a variable for it. First of all, moving event equals replicate the storage, wait for child moving elevator. So then moving event and we will fire client using that player. Okay, so for each player in that player waiting table. And then inside of our client, right, we're gonna to need to get that event one more time. Inside of our client, right, we'll paste that in. And then we'll just create another on client event function. So dot on client event connect function. And all we need to do is say exit button dot visible equals not true, but false. So now we should see if we go into it and once the countdown is finished, finished, we should not be able to exit it. There we go. We see that our button has disappeared and we can't get out. That's it. <laughs> no escape down into the basement for us. Uh, now we might want to check whether the the player limit is working correctly. So in order to do that, the best way is using a virtual server. So I can just set up a virtual server for three players. If I click start here, it's going to load up some new windows for me. We've already tested this before. Make sure we allow access. And here we go with slowly loading in with all these many names. Uh, so that's the server window. And then I've got player one, two, and three here. So we'll move player three into the elevator. He's now stuck inside there. And then we can see the countdown. I can move in with player two and he can wait as well. And then if player three comes over, he's stuck outside. You see, he can't get in. It's two out of two. And he'll just have to wait his turn. Now, eventually, when it comes back up, um, we should see the player count reset again. So let's see. It should say, does it reset? Okay, so it looks like we need to reset the, the elevator when it comes back up. So we'll disconnect the 
clean up all these windows if they're going to close for me. And we'll just call this setup function uh, once the elevator comes back up. So instead of saying moving equals false, we can just run that setup. And oh, I put a, a wait 80 instead of eight seconds. Whoops. Oh, I'm going to want to make sure that these variables, make sure we set these before we do the text. Otherwise, a number of players waiting, that's all going to be off. So yeah, we make sure we reset the table to empty and then we'll get the player count. Now, obviously at the moment when we, we play, we're not actually doing anything with the players. So the elevator is still going to come up, but we're just, uh, we're just sort of testing it in theory at this point. So let's wait for it to go back down and then come back up. And what we should see is it should say zero out of two players and waiting. Once it once it's come back up, you can see my hat just down there, just below, jumping around. So here we go. It's come back up now, and then it should say in a second zero out of two waiting. There we go. So now in theory, a new player could join. Oh, I think what happened there is my my arm managed to glitch through uh, the wall and join back in, which isn't really a problem because players should never be coming back up in the elevator. Uh, but there we go, there we go. We have our working elevator. Uh, all we need to do now is actually teleport them between places using teleport service. Okay, and we're back. You might notice things look a little bit different from the last recording we had. I'm actually doing this a few days later. You'll notice I've added to the map a little bit. We've turned it into a bit of a basic lobby area so I can click and play. Everything else is the same though. I've not changed any of the scripts. So I've just gone and built a sort of little building around our elevator, make it look a little bit more realistic. Obviously you can still see to the bottom of it, but you could go in and sort of build the grass around it if you wanted to. I've even added a bit of music in the background here, which you can hear. We've got our gnome down here and a little cursed shed, which you may remember from the our gnome jam. But anyway, all we need to do is go and add teleport service. So let's do that now. I'll hit stop and we'll head into our script. And all I'm going to do is make sure I have the teleport service at uh, our disposal. So we'll create a variable for that. Local teleport service equals game get service teleport teleport service. There we go. And then in our move elevator function, right? When we as soon as we tell the elevator to start moving downwards, that's going to be when we want to teleport our players. So let's add in a new function, local function, teleport players. And then we can call this function as soon as we start moving the elevator. So right down here, we can start teleporting them and then we'll still wait 10 seconds and then send it back up. And the rest of our logic will work the same as it did before. So in order to do a teleport, the first thing we're going to need is we're going to need a place ID, right? That's the ID of the place we want to teleport to. So that's going to be a number, something like that. But at the moment, we don't have a place ID. In order to do teleports, we need a game. At the moment, you might notice I just have this as a place file. It's just a private uh, file on my computer. It's not loaded to Roblox at all. So we're going to need to publish this to Roblox. Now make sure we're in our lobby place, right? You don't want to be doing this on the, the game place that we were using before. So with this, we can select file and publish to Roblox as we might as well do. Uh, we're going to get this warning about uh, an audio. That's fine. We'll grant permissions for that. And then we'll create a new game. And we'll just call this Tikau, the tower defense. And this is my tutorial game, right? Everything else is fine. Yep. Computer, tablet, phone. We haven't done any console, uh, team create. Um, we're not going to use that so we can disable that and that's fine. And we can click create and it'll take a, a few seconds, but yep, there we go. It's published. And you'll notice now, if we look in the top left, it no longer says, uh, episode 20 dot RBLX. It's now the actual name of my game. And so if I go to the view tab now and go to my asset manager, we now have this sort of thing here where we can see different assets that are part of the game. 
And if we double click on places, we now have this icon here, which is showing us that the place we're currently in is the, is the main place. It's got that spawn icon next to it. So what we want to do is we want to add that other place we're working on before where we had all of the gameplay and add that as a second place to the game. So we're gonna to need to go and find that, uh, that game that you're working on, whether it's a place file or maybe you published it before, it doesn't matter. We'll just go and open that up. Okay, so now I'm inside the game area. You see this is just called 19, the RBXL, because it was the 19th episode. And all I'm gonna do is file, publish to Roblox as, and I'm gonna get a bunch of warnings about audios again, that's fine, grant permissions. And instead of clicking create new game, I'm going to click this tower defense one. Okay, so it's private, right? But this is the one we just published. So we're going to click this. But instead of overwriting the that other main place, we're going to add as a new place. Okay, let's click create. And then it's going to get added as another part of our game. So now we can go back to our, our lobby. Now we're back in our lobby, nothing's changed, but if we open up the asset manager again, go to places, we should now see we have two places, tower defense, which we're in right now, and this one, which is just called gnome codes place number 80. If we want, we can rename this just to uh, game. Okay, so now we know that's the game, this is the lobby. Uh, we can't rename this because this place is gonna have the same name as our game. Anyway, now we've got that, we can copy the ID, the clipboard, copy the ID of the game, copy that ID and then put it in our elevator server script. So we can paste that in and there we go. We now have an ID that we can use to teleport to. And all we need to do is use a teleport service and we'll call the function teleport async. And all that needs to require is the ID of the game we want to teleport to. So the place ID and then the players we want to teleport. So that's a table. And if you remember, we've actually already got a table of players, which is the players waiting table. So I can just send that table. And there we go. That's actually all I need to do. And then I could just print out finished teleport. Now, if I try and click play here, uh, we're not actually going to be able to test this in studio because if I head over to the elevator, Obviously, we're going to have to wait 10 seconds. But if we just wait for that to count down, we're actually going to find we have an error in the output. So here we go, zero, and there we go. Exception while signaling cannot teleport in the Roblox Studio. And that's because you can't do teleports inside Studio. So let's go over to the website. Now we've published the game, but it's not going to show up on the places on your profile immediately. So head over to the Create tab and then you should find it there at the top, right? So if we click over here, we can open this as a new tab, the tower defense, and here it is. Uh, it's still private at the moment, so it's not publicly listed, but we can go ahead and we can play this. So here we are in game, not usually the best place for testing, but obviously we have to do it for, for our teleports. Now we can bring up F9, or we'll press F9 on our keyboard, and then we can bring up the, the output just like we'd see in the server. Well, let's head into the lobby anyway. And hopefully when the countdowns work, it should send us to the new place. We can just keep an eye on the output, see if anything goes wrong. And there we go, it says finish teleport. We've not got any error and we've disport down at the void. And then look, we've been teleported. Fantastic. Oh, it looks like we've still got this waiting for one more player thing. We'll probably want to disable that in our other place. But there we go. We know our teleport is working. Good news. We can exit out of the game now, and then we're gonna head back into Studio. Okay, so we're back inside Studio, and there are a few little changes we need to make. Sure, our teleport system does work, but we can improve it a little bit. Now, first of all, this is just gonna send all these players to a server, right? We're not actually sort of reserving a server or giving them a, a private server, as it were. So if two people are teleported, and then another people another two people come along and enter into the elevator, they'll probably be teleported to that same server as the last two players. Obviously, we don't want that. We need a, a way to create a private server or in Roblox terms, reserve it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna add to this now and we're gonna say local server equals 
teleport service and we use a function called reserve server. And what we need to do, whoop, what we need to do here is we need to provide an ID of the, of the place we want to reserve. So we copy the place ID variable again. And then this, this is going to provide us with the server to teleport towards. So we just need to make use of now something called teleport options. So local options will equal instance.new and we'll create a teleport options instance. And then it's just a case of saying the options dot the reserved server access code. And that's equal to that server that we just got, okay, from the reserve server function. So now we've got this special teleport options we've created. We can just pass that in as a third parameter. So comma, space, and then we just put in those options to the server. So that will fix the, our problem with other players ending up in the server that we don't want. But a, another thing to bear in mind with teleport service is it's not always perfect, right? Because it's got a query Roblox, it's got to request that server and it's got to send it back, right? There's a lot that can break along the way with all these different network connections that need to happen. And teleport service could fail at any time. So in order to do this, we probably want to use something called a P call or a protected call. Now, this doesn't prevent errors, but it does allow us to sort of handle them and then choose what we want to happen. Now, I was going to write my own version of this, but it turns out there's actually an article on the Roblox Wiki. If you head to the teleport between places page, you'll find they've actually got this whole section on handling failed teleports. Right, and they're doing a similar thing here, right? They're using a P call, they're attempting to teleport, and then if it's not successful, then they're going to wait and keep trying. And then otherwise, you know, they will just return success. So what we can actually do is we can take all of this code here and copy it. I'll leave a link to this article for you to have a look. Hopefully it's still online by the time you watch this video. But if not, I'll um, maybe provide a paste bin or something like that. But anyway, we're going to take this code and put it into our place now. So we're back inside the lobby place. And now we're going to create a new module script. So head to server script service, add in a module script and paste in all of that code. And then we're going to name the module script. We'll name it safe teleport. And so now we can head back into the elevator server script and we need to require that module script we just created. So that's easy enough. At the top of the script, we just type local safe teleport equals require and server script. Oh, we need a variable for that as well, don't we? Local server script service equals game get service server script service and then we can say server script service dot safe teleport so now we have this we can actually just call the function so instead of using teleport a sync we can just call the function safe teleport and then provide the parameters of the place id the server we want to send it to so no not the server the the players waiting right the players that we want to teleport and finally, the options, which includes the server we want to go to. And you'll notice the parameters are all in the same order as we had before, because this safe teleport module, it requires the same ones. And this is actually just calling teleport async, but just in this kind of wrapper, right, where it's going to attempt it up to, up to five times. And it's just going to wait one second each time. And if it doesn't work after those five attempts, then we're going to error or just wait a little bit and then keep trying. But that's a handy little module we can make use of, right? Rather than set out, save us a bit of time anyway. So now we've got that, we've got our script changed over here. And let's go ahead and file publish to Roblox to update those changes. So now I'm inside the gameplay place. And in here, how about we just head into our main script and we'll set the min players back to one. Okay, so we're not going to get that annoying message stopping us. And we need to publish from this place as well. So each time you make a place 
update, you need to make sure you're publishing that so it takes effect in the actual game for when people play from the website. So we can check our safe teleport is working. It should do. We won't really notice any changes on our end, but it just means, you know, in a bad case scenario that we can be rest assured that it's being going to be much more reliable. So we go down into the void and eventually we should be teleported. There's a little bit of a delay. We could use some GUI if we wanted to uh, make it more clear. But here we go. Now we've got our map voting, right? So we can vote in the islands or whatever. And eventually the game will start for us. So we go. We have got our lobby service, uh, our lobby service, our lobby system using teleport service in action. Now, the only thing to bear in mind here is that when we end up getting killed, we have that end screen. And when they reach the end screen, uh, we want to be able to teleport back to the lobby. So we're going to need to add a little bit of code to handle that, aren't we? So let's exit out of here and head back into our game place just to finish that off. Now we're going to need to make use of this safe teleport module script again. So we'll copy this and then we're going to go and open up our game place. So if you haven't already got it open, remember you go to asset manager and then you go to your places and then you should see it there game and we can just open it up like so. And here we are. So we're going to paste that module script into service script service like so. And we're going to need to head into our local script now um, for the, the game GUI. If we go down here, remember this end screen that we created? If I set this to visible for a second, this one over here, which either says game over or victory, it's got this exit button. But we never actually scripted this exit button, did we? So that's what we're going to need to do next. Head into the game controller script. And we'll head to the display end screen function. Here it is. And right at the bottom here, after we've done all this playing and so on, let's set up a, a event. Okay. And we'll just call this exit game. And then over here, we're going to need to grab the events, which will be in replicated and storage, wait for child events and the exit event, the exit event, which is events wait for child exit game and so now we have both of them we need to detect when they click that exit button so that's going to be the the screen we've already got available for that the screen being the end screen screen dot and our exit button we just named it exit so screen dot exit dot activated connect that into a function and probably when they click, we want to hide the, the menu. So we can say screen dot visible equals false. It would, again, it'd probably be a good idea to have a sort of teleporting GUI, though we're not going to bother doing that just now. And then we're going to want to say exit event and fire server. So let's just go and create a new server script for ourselves to handle that. So server script service, new script. And we will just call this uh, teleport on exit. That will work for us. Well, we can actually go and copy those lines about the events. We're going to need both of them. So we can copy and paste them in. We're going to need a variable for the replicated storage. Storage equals game get service replicated storage. We're going to need a variable for the server script service server script service equals game get service server script service and we're also going to need to require that safe teleport module that we just added so local safe teleport equals require and again we put it in the server script service so it's just dot teleport on exit because uh sorry not teleport on exit dot safe teleport that's what we called it so it's just this one here we want to access and once we've done all of this, we can create our local function teleport, which is just going to have a single player this time rather than a big table of them. And then whenever that exit event is has an on server event, whenever the event is sent to the server, we can going to connect that to the teleport function. So this is going to be 
pretty much the same code from our our lobby game, right? We can have the, the local place ID. And how about we just go and copy this from our other place? So let's uh, grab all of this, control C and control V. There we go, that saves us a little bit of time. Oh, and we're gonna need the teleport service as well, aren't we? Because we can see that's underlined. So at the top of our script, local teleport service equals game, get service, teleport service, super. And where we've got players waiting, uh, we don't need to send a table anymore. We just need to send a single player. Now we can't just put the player on their own because this function still expects a table of players. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna wrap this inside uh, these curly brackets, which are gonna make it into a table, but a table just containing the one value. Now, if we wanted to send some information back to the lobby, maybe how much gold they'd earn, something like that, then it would just be a case of saying options, set teleport data, and then you just provide a table. So we'd use these curly brackets, and then you could just put something like gold, and then you set that equal to uh, player.gold.value, right? Because I created that gold, remember, in our on player added script. We have this gold here that we just chucked inside the player. So I could access that here if I wanted. Again, this is just an example. You could uh, do what you like. You'd maybe like to save it first. Um, but we don't need to have a reserved server anymore. So we can delete this line, which reserves the server, and this line as well, because that doesn't matter anymore. We just want to send them into a public lobby. And then we'll call the safe teleport, and sure, we can print out finished once more. So that should be all the coding we need to do on the game end of things. So we're gonna get these three zombies, and as soon as we kill these, we should win the round. That should be nice and easy for us. There we go, hurrah, we won. So let's see if we click exit, we should be teleported back. If we look in the output, oh, there we go. <laughs> Whoops, we made a quick mistake there. We put the wrong ID. So we just teleported ourselves into a new game. That was a bit of an amateur mistake, wasn't it? No worries, we can quickly fix that. Let's head back into studio. Um, but if we just go to view, asset manager, places, and this time, make sure we copy the ID for the, the place of the little spawn icon where it says tower defense. That's our main lobby. So copy that and teleport and exit. Instead of this ID, we're going to move that and replace it with this one. There we go. And this teleport data that we've sent, uh, if we want to access that from our server, we can do that easily enough. Uh, let's just make sure we publish the changes here, first of all. And then we're gonna head back into our lobby. Here we are. And I'm just gonna add in a new service script. And we just call this uh, layer added. And so this is, uh, you know, this is the kind of thing, right? Local players equals game, get service. Players, we've done this many times before. Players dot player added, not player removing, player added. Connect that into a function which takes the player who's just joined as its parameter and then we're going to use a function called so local join data will equal the player and we can call the get join data function so if a player has teleported in they're teleported back to the lobby and they have any teleport data with them like we set in the game place then this function is going to get it for us so we can say local teleport data will equal the join data dot that teleport data that we're just talking about. And then we can check if we have got teleport data and that teleport data contains something called gold, then we'll just print it out, okay? We could use this for some kind of shop system if we wanted, but obviously that'd be the out of the scope of this video. So we'll just print out player.name rejoin the lobby with and teleport data dot gold and then we'll just say gold coins or something okay so that will just print us out so we know that the the data is being sent back 
Again, you would probably want to use data stores rather than relying on teleporting them back and forth in case they leave the game. But this is an example of sending data with the teleport if you wanted to. But let's uh, make sure we publish this. There we go. And we'll head back to the website to test one more time. And here we go, victory. And if we click exit, the, the UI is gonna all disable. And we should get teleported right back into the lobby. If I press F9, we should see in the server, it says no code rejoined lobby with 10 gold coins. Now, obviously we're not actually doing anything with that data, but we can at least see it's working. Pretty cool. So there we have it, our completed teleportation system. We might as well go and add in a second elevator while we're here. So we can just duplicate that, paste the next one in. We'll have to remove a few of these fence pieces. Perfect. And then all we'd have to do is click one of them. And then if we make this one the four player one, so we just change the config to four. And then we can change the screen a little bit too. We'll set this to be uh, the title. Let's have this as a, as a green background instead. Make that a little bit more jazzy. And the title will update automatically anyway, but just so we know, we can set that to zero out of four. There we go. We don't need to change any of the scripts because that's already set by our config. And there we go. We, I think we have successfully done our elevator. Uh, we might want to set these parts to invisible now that I think about it. <laughs> we'll get to the end of this video eventually. There we go, shaft. We set this to transparency one. There we go, that looks a little bit nicer. And same for this one as well. Shaft, transparency one. There we go. So if you've made it this far through the series, then congratulations to you. You now have a working lobby system and hopefully a working tower defense game as well. Congratulations, congratulations for making it this far. And I hope your tower defense game is coming along nicely. If you have found this series helpful, then please leave a like, leave a comment. I really appreciate it. And I'll be seeing you all in another video soon. So thank you all for watching and I wish you farewell. Goodbye.